My name is Kathy Lehman. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist. And just brief, I want to explain what that means because a lot of people get confused about what a dietitian is and what a nutritionist is, or they don't know the difference. Um, so as a dietitian, we are credentialed through the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and we have continuing education we have to keep up every five years. And we not only have degrees in nutrition, but we also have to perform, when I did it, it was a 900 hour, now it's, I think it's a thousand, it could be 1200 hour professional registration um, rotation, a clinical rotation. So when you do your internship and you successfully complete that, then you sit for a four and a half hour exam, and once you complete that successfully, then you can use the credentials registered dietitian. And so all dietitians are nutritionists, but all, not all nutritionists are dietitians. Does that make sense? So any of you essentially could be a nutritionist. There's no regulation over that term, but as a dietitian, we're very closely tightly regulated. So we like to look at ourselves as um, the nutrition experts and really the go-to for the science of nutrition. Yesterday was all about science. Nutrition is a science, it's not an opinion. And I always like to share that because everybody has an opinion on nutrition. Just read a blog, any blog, not yours. I'm not, <laughs> but um, there are a lot of eat like me, look like me blogs out there that profess to be nutritionally based and they're not, so just caution there. But uh, so, so that's the difference there. And so, but I'm not gonna go into the heavy duty science because that would be really boring for all of you because you're not dietitians. And just two weeks ago, I was in Boston and we had our annual Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Nutrition Conference and the science is up to your eyeballs science. So it's fascinating. This is a topic I could talk about forever, but we just an hour is what we have together. So let me make sure I can make this work. All right, so I think it's really interesting we're talking about nutrition in the Big Apple. Get it? Okay, so I know, I know. Apples are kind of like dietitians' best friends. All right, so I wanted to take a moment to ask you a question. So let's say you have the opportunity to meet with a dietitian who can give you really excellent guidance on managing your disease with a nutrition recommendation that is proven, guaranteed, to drive no more treatment, no more side effects, drive into remission, not only to remission, but just eradicate the disease. You're good, you're golden, your energy is good, your stamina is good. Would you be up for that? Okay, so here's what the, here's what the dietitian says to you. There are a handful of recommendations. Number one is you can eat anything you want. Secondly, just be careful about how much you eat. Try not to eat too much. And finally, every single day, 365 days a year, you must drink two cups of yak milk. Now, you would be like, okay, eat anything I want. Got that. I'm already doing it. I can handle that. Not eat too much of it. That's a little tricky. I'm working on that. That's challenging to stop when you need to stop. But the yak milk thing, I, you know, I don't know what a yak is. I, I don't even, I don't drink cow's milk. I'm pretty sure I'm not gonna drink yak milk. I don't know where I would find it. When I go to conferences or I travel, they might not have yak milk. I like milk in my coffee. What am I, I cannot sustain this nutritional protocol that this person who is an expert in nutrition is telling me I need to do. So what do you feel like at that point? You might feel like you're already losing at the game of caring for yourself, right? You might feel guilty if you drink cow's milk and not yak milk. You might just abandon all of your efforts to take care of yourself because you're like, there's no way I can do this, but that's the critical piece, right? So the reason I'm giving you that example, and there's no such thing, by the way, that is, I completely made that up, completely. So the idea behind that is when it comes to nutrition, as a dietitian, I use very broad, general, professional guidelines and recommendations and standards in order to work individually with someone or to speak to a group, all right? But when I am working with a group or, or individuals where we can pull down some of those broad concepts and make them very specific, that is really where you're going to get the most power out of your own approach to nutrition. Because if you remember, 
the title of my presentation is a three-step method for aligning individualized nutrition with personal health goals. So what's the definition of individualized and personal? And that is to take something and make it unique to you, right, to change something so that it fits specifically for you. So where the confusion lies, I think, in so much of the nutrition information that's out there, first of all, is um, it changes often, right, and we're going to talk about that, but it also, you're, you get overwhelmed, right, so you're not really sure what's the right thing for you to do or what would be most beneficial for you, or you read a new book or you see something, a snippet on social media, you're like, maybe I'll try that, maybe I'll try that, but at the end of the day, you want to do what makes you feel best, what you can sustain and what makes you individually feel good in your body. So we're going to talk about the three-step method that I, that I have for all of you. And so first of all, the first step is to identify your individual health goal. Secondly, identify the health values that you hold, and we're going to learn how to align actions to support those values. And then finally, I'm going to introduce to you a principle that I use. It's called E Q. FV. It's a collection of acronyms, and I'll share with you what that means as we get to that. But individually, any one of those steps can be really powerful, but I'm going to cram them all into today's presentation and share that with you, because I think collectively there's just a lot of, a lot of valuable information there. So all right, moving on from there, let me tell you one other thing. Um, I am a dietitian. I, I, I have a private practice in the Chicago area. Anybody here from Chicago, Chicago area? Okay, so I, I work individually with people who struggle with food in terms of um, having unhealthy relationships with food, disordered eating, um, plant-based nutrition education, vegan, vegetarian, just trying to shift a little bit more away from the meat in, into, de depending on where you want to fall on that continuum. And, um, and just recently, there's been a new shift to my practice, which I'll share with you in a moment. So, and then I do a lot of speaking and a lot of writing on, on nutrition as well for wellness and prevention and management of disease. So, oops, like Steve, here's my, this is a slide that always makes me feel a little awkward because they're all me, but there's a point behind this. So um, I am a very active girl and I, I am a clinician who walks the talk. So I don't think there's anything more challenging for someone I'm working with than me to be recommending move as much as you can, eat as well as you can maintain, sustain, and tolerate, but I don't do any of that. You would not, no one would listen to my message, right? You would shut down right away. But I am, this is my philosophy throughout my adulthood. It's been my philosophy in high school. I was a runner, I was on the dance team, always active, and so, the bottom two photos, um, August 2014, those were taken in Breckenridge where I was vacationing with my husband, doing a lot of really amazing hiking where there is not a lot of oxygen. And I kind of didn't put this together at the time, but I was also doing the last week of my training, and you know all about this, Steve, my, um, my last week of long runs before I went back and about 10 days after I returned to Chicago, I would do the Chicago Half Marathon. And so training without oxygen really was amazing because when I got back to Chicago, 10 days later did my half marathon, I PR'd because I was like rocket fuel. I was, I'm not a fast runner at all. I'm just steady and endurance. But I was like, wow, who knew? But that worked in my favor. So again, this collection of photos is not to impress you on how active I am, but it is to impress upon you how committed I am to the importance of physical activity, not just for me, but for everyone that I work with. And on top of that, just to kind of, as a, as a footnote, this was last Sunday when I was not speaking, but I was running and kind of going over this presentation in my head as I was running, thinking, I gotta get a picture of this to include. Um, so this was my fifth, it could be my last. I don't know, the training is, takes a lot of time, but there is something about the endorphins and, and the way it really supports just every, every, every piece of the health um, whoever, you asked the question about the science behind fitness and nutrition, and we could talk about that, but there's a lot of it. And so you can probably imagine how ironic and surprising and shocking it was when I found myself, um, actually, I didn't include it on this slide because we're not talking about my experience, but I wanted to weave it, my story into this so that you can see um, no medical history. I don't have any children, so I've never done, the, oh, I've never been to the hospital except to have my kids. Don't even have that. 
I went into private practice as a dietitian to keep people out of hospitals. Never worked as a clinical dietitian. Did all my work in prevention and wellness and risk reduction. That's, that's been my number one focus. So four weeks after this half marathon, I had a mammogram, ultrasound, and we were off to the races where October 27th, two years ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I'm not quite at that acceptance place. This is still, I've been very private about it. But I have known from day one that I was going to integrate this experience into my work. And so the opportunity, Susan, to come here and speak with you about this. This is the third presentation I've done in two years, which is, an, I've done a lot of presentations, but not about this, where I just feel like each time I do this, it helps me get closer to that acceptance place, and it allows me to use the foundation of work that I've built over the last 19 years to underscore my message for you. And it also, for all of you, it helps me, mm, it helps you understand that I, I understand. Let's just put it that way, I get it. So this was such a, a crazy, crazy thing and the disbelief and the denial, and I'm still kind of there, but I'm getting closer. And for me, it was rage, corrosive anger that I'm using Rather than homicide, I'm going to use it in a really positive way. Because I'm thinking, I can't help a lot of people from jail, so I will just speak all over the world and we'll do that. So, so that's a, just a, this is not a breast cancer presentation, but I want you to know that there is anything you do for your health in terms of trying to elevate your health from a nutritional, lifestyle, fitness standpoint, it is going to touch every type of cancer. It will touch every other type of disease. So we'll talk about that as well. But I, the message from that is, and, and I know this because believe me, if anyone could control cancer, it would be me. But you can't, as you all know, but you can take charge of your personal health. And even if you've done nothing and I mean nothing to take charge of your personal health until today. Something about Steve's presentation or about mine sparks like, oh, I think, I think I'm going to get on that. It's not too late. And you don't have to go full out. Just you can eat the elephant one bite at a time. I love that saying. Um, just, take, just do what you can tolerate. My mantra was, you picked the wrong body. And I really believe, as do my doctors, that my outcome was so favorable, in addition to a lot of luck and timing, uh, because I was so physically resilient, that I was so strong in my physical fitness and that my nutrition was in such a good place, although I still elevated it before I went into treatment. Um, but it served me well. I ran through all of my treatment, lifted weights. I would go to the gym in the morning, and, and admittedly, I didn't need chemo. I was very fortunate in there. I had radiation, and I had a lumpectomy and then radiation. And I would go to the gym in the morning with the X's on my chest, marked up for my radiation. I would work out with all my guys in the weight room. They didn't know, because remember, I didn't tell any, many people. And I would leave and go, <sighs> they're all like, oh, I have a meeting in Chicago. Oh, I've got to go. I'm like, got to go to radiation. So it was just a really weird head thing. But it really helped me, again, stay moving and stay focused on this is what I can be in charge of. So that's really the message that I want to underscore what we talk about today. And so when we talk about that connection between nutrition and food and weight and activity, I go to the science. Remember, nutrition is a science. Exercise physiology is a science. Our bodies are all biochemistry and science, all right? So when I work, um, the work that I, I do is all evidence-based practice. So I go to the research to see not just what is new and trending and in all the social um, on all the newspapers and all the websites because they'll pull a snippet from a new study and make a big overblown <laughs> declaration about apples will cure cancer in 20 minutes if you eat 15 every five minutes. I mean, crazy stuff that doesn't make sense and doesn't hold up. So I use as the base of my work for cancer, these three organizations. So if you're not familiar with them, I'll just briefly share what they do. So the World Cancer Research Fund, is um, it's, that's the world's leading authority on the link between diet and activity and cancer. And they collaboratively work with the World Health Organization. So if you don't know what the world WHO is, it's essentially like a global public health mission. So their focus is really global public health in terms of reducing risk of 
um, disease and prevention, ideally. And then the American Institute for Cancer Research was founded in 1982. And at that time, they, it was a really radical idea that nutrition and lifestyle could prevent cancer. And even to this day, there are medical professionals who will say we can't use the word prevent because we're not there yet. And I, to a certain extent, I agree. Because again, believe me, if you could prevent it, we, I wouldn't have shared that story with you. But um, I really think there are preventive strategies that we can implement, and the research does support that. And so if it makes anybody feel more comfortable, we can use the term risk reduction strategies that are preventive in nature, ideally. Right? There's no, again, nothing is 100% um, guaranteed. But what the American Institute for Cancer Research does is they focus again on that link between diet and cancer, and they support cutting edge research in that area, and then they collaborate with the World Cancer Research Fund, who collaborates with World Health Organization, and what I think is a wonderful, wonderful project that also has come out of this is ongoing, and if you're not familiar with this, I recommend you take a look at it, and I have some re resources at the end of the, my program, but the continuous update project is, um, it's a scientific research from around the world. And it's collated, it's included in a, in a database, and it's systematically reviewed. And this independent panel of experts take that information and the conclusions that they form from the basis of the, this reviewing is where the cancer prevention recommendations that we're familiar with come from. So this continuing update project is, um, based on looking at evidence, critical research peer-reviewed evidence. And they look at the amount of evidence. If there's one study with 10 people in it, that's not a strong study. It could be interesting, but it's not really going to benefit us in terms of making strong recommendations. They look at the consistency of the evidence. They look at the quality of the evidence. So is it a study funded by Pepsi about drinking more soda, and it will make you healthier. That would not be a quality study either, and there would be conflict of interest. So looking at all of those things, the CUP program breaks down recommendations for a very large number of cancers and makes recommendations for prevention, particularly prevention. There are a handful of cancers, and cutaneous lymphoma falls under that heading, where there is not enough strong research to support a direct link to lifestyle making a difference. However, and I want to make sure you hear me say this, I am not saying, it doesn't matter, do whatever you want, don't take care of yourself because it doesn't matter anyway. I'm not saying that. Steve's living proof that I'm not saying that. What the message is, is it doesn't mean the evidence doesn't exist. It just means today it's not strong enough to have a definite link where they can comfortably and professionally say, yes, here's what we're seeing. They're saying, this is interesting. We're gathering information when the body of evidence is growing. We'll get back to you. So just stay tuned, right? So that's the beauty and the madness at the same time of research is that it's ongoing and we don't know yet. So, so don't discount the, the great things that you can do because remember, we're not just if you decide, I'm going to go home and have broccoli today, because Kathy and Steve inspired me so much, I'm going to eat broccoli for the rest of the day, and that'll help my cancer. It helps cancer. It helps diabetes. It helps heart disease. It helps hypertension. It helps blood, all those things, right? So think about it in, with a wider lens, if, if, that, if that helps you. OK. But what we do know is that this connection between diet and physical activity and body weight are inseparable. And the research, particularly in breast cancer, prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, is very strong in terms of looking at direct correlations between diet and activity and risk reduction, particularly in postmenopausal breast cancer. The most common breast cancer is estrogen-driven, hormonally-driven breast cancer no family history. That is 85% of breast cancers have no family history. Mine did not. We do now. I'm always the first. I'm the first born. I am I'm the first to go to college. I'm the first to get, yeah, well, it's, it's got to start somewhere. So there's a reason, because I'm the one who can do this sort of work. That's what I'm thinking. All right, but there is a very strong connection in all of those, particularly for those cancers, but across the board in terms of strengthening your immune system, your stamina, your energy, 
as you'll see as I continue, those are so tightly connected and the research supports that. And so what we know with the current scientific evidence is, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about physical activity, but I'm also a personal trainer. So my background, my, my graduate degree is in health psychology. I'm certified as a personal trainer and I have my nutrition degree and my RD. So I work from this three-legged stool of psychology, nutrition, and fitness. And in my mind, you can't separate any of those, okay? So I'm not gonna talk a lot about, about, about the physical activity, but just put it in the back of your mind and know that every time I'm talking about lifestyle, that's part of that. So this, paying attention to the nutrition and lifestyle can improve your quality of life just overall, right? Energy, stamina, focus, cognitive ability. Comorbid conditions such as I mentioned before, diabetes, heart disease, um, and then development of second primary cancers. The beautiful thing and kind of can be scary at the same time is we're being treated earlier you live with continuous lymphoma and in whatever form that takes for each of you. Breast cancer, I hate the word survivor, I like the word sur thriver. Um, that, when you come through that and you are um, you know, going on with the rest of your life, they're, they're finding it earlier, they're treating it earlier, they're treating it with better drugs and treatment, you live longer, which is a great thing, yet it still then puts you at risk of the disease, diseases of aging, so heart disease. And, and again, all those other things. And particularly for all of you, some of the medications and treatments can have an impact on your lipid values, thyroid, all of those respond, particularly the, the heart disease side of things, respond very, very well to diet and exercise. So we wanna keep that in mind too, as how, how it, paying attention to the nutrition and fitness can make a difference. So when you feed your body well, you are doing such a world of good that you don't even think about. I think we get so caught up in, is this a good food, is this a bad food? Well, if it's a good food, like the broccoli, if I eat the broccoli, I am good. I get a halo, I was good today, right? If you don't do that, if you decide all I wanna eat today is chocolate, even if it's dark, at the highest percent cocoa you can tolerate, that's not so healthy for you either, but you feel sort of virtuous. You're like, well, at least it wasn't french fries, right? So we kind of have this mind game of with, we play with our food. And the bottom line is your body needs about 41 different nutrients every single day to function. And we are well beyond the place of looking at deficiencies. I mean, we're not... It, it's interesting, rickets have, you know, rickets, it's a vitamin D deficiency. We've seen that resurface again. Vitamin C, scurvy, is a, we don't see that too often anymore. So we've kind of moved beyond that. And what we need to look at is how are you fueling your body so that your body can perform the way it is built to perform, which is 100% high octane every single day, right? So you don't wake up in the morning and think, wow, I, you know, I really, I need molybdenum today, so I'm gonna make sure I eat every food that has molybdenum, so I get enough. You don't think like that, you just, you d but your body knows if it's missing something. So look at all of these amazing things that feeding your body well can do. So if you're still in treatment, or you're not still in treatment, I'm just pointing to you because you just were, um, and I get that. When you are in treatment, this is what my doctors always said to me, they're like, same as you, they're like, we got nothing. We don't see patients like you. I, yeah, we don't see blood pressures like this. We don't see body weights like this. We just, we, you're good, just keep doing what you're doing, right? So it really supported healthy outcomes. And that is really my mission and my, my work going forward is to underscore wherever you are in that cancer continuum with, that other t with whatever type of cancer you're struggling with, um, the better you can support yourself to become physically resilient, you can improve um, your tolerance for treatment, your tolerance for medication. There are a lot of side effects, of course, as Steve mentioned, with side effects, side effects with medicine. I take a medication, have to take it for five years. I was terrified. I take nothing. I take, you know, a vitamin and some fish oil and, you know, I'm good. The thought that I had to do that, it takes something that could impact the way my body feels when I feel amazing every single day where the joint pain and all the other side effects could impact me and impact my activity level. Again, back to that homicidal anger, right? But I am managing to withstand that from a, in a better way. It could be physiology, I just might be built to withstand that medication better, but the research supports, and there is good literature that supports the more active women are who take this medication, 
the better their tolerance of the medication physically. So, um, but then that comes to the question of, okay, so what food should I be eating? You know, what should I not be eating, first of all, because it might cause my cancer or it might cause another type of cancer or it might make my cancer get worse. And the flip side of that is what's protective. We don't have any single perfect way of categorizing that evidence on food and nutrition yet, which I know you're all like, okay, I'm not listening. I'm done. <laughs> Goodbye. But here's, here's what I want you to stay with me. I'm going to show you a, little, a very brief overview of why it's such a challenge for researchers as well as myself to give such concrete recommendations and say, if you do this, you will get that. So people eat food, not nutrients. So we were just talking about it. So we've moved beyond the problem of having scurvy and all those sorts of things. But you'll see in, in the social media and out there in the, the lay person of nutrition world, you know, eat more vitamin A, it'll do this. Eat more vitamin D, it'll do that. Eat more of this phytonutrient, it will do that. And there is, there is legitimacy to those messages. Yet we, again, don't sit down and say, I'm going to have a bowl of calcium. You sit down and say, I'm going to have a bowl of ice cream. Or I'm going to have a bowl of yogurt, right? So because we eat food, there's something called synergy between all of those nutrients in the food that work in your body in a way that we can't always replicate in supplements or always tease out in the laboratory. And the synergy of those nutrients, it's not only that. If you think about an apple, what is an apple? It is vitamin C, it's something called quercetin, which is a phytochemical, there's fiber, there are all kinds of, there are nutrients we don't even know about yet. That synergistic connection and the way it works in your body is what confers health, not just the vitamin C or the fiber in the apple. Does that make sense? So that makes it a little more complicated. Um, food and timing uh, is really fascinating to me. There is some um, interesting information uh, research that shows, uh, that looks at nutrition at birth through the time of a, a young girl's first period and then her first pregnancy and the connection to breast cancer. And again, I'm not making this only about breast cancer, but that's where the research is strongest and what I'm most familiar with. So if there was something for cutaneous lymphoma, believe me, I'd be using it. But just to impress upon you that there are some interesting connections they're looking at. There's also evidence that is increasing that's showing that eating red meat as an adolescent may impact the type of breast cancer or the development of some types of breast cancer later in life. As well as um, looking at alcohol consumption, there's a very strong link between alcohol, not just wine, but alcohol in any form, um, and breast cancer. So looking at alcohol consumption in young adult women and breast cancer later in life. So that timing spectrum, so when I say, if I could have controlled or prevented breast cancer, I, that I would be the girl to do it. In my 20s, do you think, what do you think I was doing in my 20s? <laughs> wasn't broccoli. Let's just put it that way. So think about cancer takes a long time to develop, and it's wily. So when we're looking at this timing, you don't really know what may have occurred 10, 20, 30 years ago that may have an impact. We also look at the pattern, dietary pattern, not just one day or one food. So tomorrow's Halloween. If you decide, OK, every Halloween I have to have a Snickers bar because that's my tradition. But I shouldn't, because I heard that dietitian talk yesterday. I'm going to feel guilty. Don't do that, because one Snickers bar isn't going to make a difference, right? So we look at the pattern over the long term of how someone eats. So if you eat mostly healthy, that's going to give you benefit. Um, there are very strong variations in metabolism. We could all go out to lunch. We could all eat exactly the same thing in the same amount. We would all metabolize it somewhat differently. We all have the same parts, liver, heart lungs, you know, everything involved in digestion, you know, small intestine, large intestine. But the gut bacteria, the metabolism, the way we're all wired in that way, um, even genetic diversity, the race, you know, between different race, gender, microbial diversity in the gut, it's really interesting how that impacts what comes out on the other end, literally. So speaking, last week I was at my conference, it just occurred to me that made a lot of sense, literally. Um, but when I was at the nutrition conference last week, there were two huge, packed with dietitian programs on the gut microbiome. So if you're not familiar with that, I would suggest take, just do a Google search on it. Do gut microbiome and cancer. It's pretty fascinating um, because what we feed is, you know, how it impacts. So those are all things that make nutrition a little murkier than the lay population would like it to be. Um, but what we can take away from that is there's no single food or food 
component that's protective. And there's no diet that's bulletproof, because again, I, I would have that cornered if it were. Um, so just remember that, but we do know that lifestyle choices make a difference. So remember, there are no bad foods. This is kind of my mantra. When I, have, when I work with clients one-on-one, um, -on -one, I tell them, if you come in my office and you say, I was really bad because I had macaroni and cheese yesterday, you have to give me a quarter. So I keep a jar. I keep a quarter every time somebody says, I was bad. Because you're not bad. Food is not bad. Choices can be, you can make better choices than others. You could make some bad choices in life, right? You can make some good choices in life. But we do know that the choices matter, again, between these, these three things. But what happens when someone starts talking to you about changing your food habits and your exercise habits? What happens? You all get really freaked out, don't you? You can be honest. You can be like, I, nobody is taking my Diet Pepsi because I love my Diet Pepsi. And that's OK. Here's what happens. People get scared that their fun is going to be over, right? Food is fun. It should be. It's celebration. It's ritual. It's, there's religious content. There, it's, it plays a lot of different roles. This is the psychology of food that is so fascinating. Um, people get overwhelmed with where to start. They get really unclear and unsure about how to start. And then they're afraid, this is a really common thing, that once they start, they kind of are so, we're so programmed to think, oh, if I eat healthy, I must be on a diet, right? So if you're dieting, that means I've started something new. And if I don't quite attempt and, and succeed at it, I've failed. So people feel they're failing at eating well. We place too much of that sort of judgment on food and our, and our habits with food, right? So we need to back away from that. And I'm going to actually show you how to overcome this fear of changing and making, making some, some changes to your personal health. So I know it's scary, but just stick with me. So the first thing I'd like you to do before we get started, we're going to do a couple of exercises together because I don't want you all falling asleep. All right, see the green paper in your handouts? You haven't eaten the chocolate yet, have you? Good. Hey, but you know what? We have extra, because I knew someone would eat it. I'm like, OK, we have more in case anyone can't wait. I plan for everything. Right, Bridget? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So pick a whole, grab your green sheet of paper. It's blank. All right, so if you will indulge me. So remember, we're talking about individual personal. That's what we're talking about. So if you'll fold it, fold it lengthwise like this. So you have this long sheet of paper you're going to fold. Straight up and down. OK. Now fold it again in half. So now you have two sides that are folded, and you have two sides that are open. On the folded sides, just randomly rip your paper. Rip it and pull out little pieces of it, OK? So it doesn't have to be like the best art project on the planet. Just And please put these in your bag or something. Don't throw them on the floor, because I don't want to get in trouble with the housekeeping people. So do something with your little pieces. So just, and if you want to, you can like close your eyes and not look at what you're ripping. They can be big rips. They can be small rips. Just rip on both folded sides. And when you are finished, I'll do this with you. Just keep ripping. Rip until you've, it's kind of cathartic, isn't it, just to rip paper like that? It feels good. Yeah. It's kind of like helps you manage strong emotions <laughs> without, you know, endangering the lives of other people. OK. So once you have that done, we all finished ripping? All right, let me move it. All right, so open your paper and hold it up. And show everyone your paper. All right, I, if you could see from where I am, there are no two papers that are exactly alike. They are all individual. Look at mine could be a mask, for heaven's sake, right? I didn't even plan that, but that's kind of cool. So you're all, there may be some similarities, because you only have so much ripping room, right? But they are not exactly, ooh, I like that one. That is really fancy. So hold on to this paper, because I'd like you to use it to make some notes. And to remind you, I know you have to write around the holes, but that'll make it interesting. Because who wants to only write on paper that has no holes? We're doing things in a fun way today. All right. So let's say, so what we're going to do is we're going to identify some personal health goals. And I'm going to help you do that. So let's say these are. These are three health goals that pretty much, I hear this a lot, and pretty much anyone could be um, on track with this. So this is a person, let's say they want to eat less junk food, they want to eat more fruits and vegetables, and they want to eat out less often. All right, so I want you to take one minute, and I would like you to think about what's your personal health goal. 
It could be one, it could be two, it could be three. You could use one of these if this is, if you're like, oh yeah, I wanna do all of those. Steal mine, that's okay, that's what they're here for. But write it down on your piece of paper. What's your health goal? And while you're writing, I'm gonna keep talking because I don't wanna go over time. And so this is the second part of this. We want specific and measurable ways to accomplish these goals that you write down. But this is where people get overwhelmed. Specific and measurable means did I or didn't I? Right? When people come in and say to me, I'm going to eat less junk food, I go, okay, how are you going to know if you do that? So the first thing I have them do is think about what's your, okay, let's figure this out. What's your favorite junk food? This person's is potato chips. How do you eat them? I eat them out of the bag, in front of the TV, after everyone goes to sleep, five nights a week. That, this is not uncommon. So if it's you, don't, this is not a judgment. This is just like, you're like, oh, good, someone else does that, right? That's, that's where you'll find that. So... What I help them do, here's the specific and measurable part of this. Can you eat chips only when you're eating out? That way you don't have them in the house, so you can't eat them in front of the TV, right? You have to find your tolerance level. Someone who's an overachiever would be like, I can do all three of those things. I'm going to do this. Someone who's like, yeah, I'll start with one, may do number one, chips when eating out. Buy individual size serving bags, make individual size serving bags. Eat only in the kitchen. Not in front of the TV, off dishware, which is just a novel idea, really. <laughs> and sitting down, which is an even more novel idea. Because how many of you have been in New York for more than just a day? Yeah, I've been here since Thursday. Peep, there, peep, no one is not eating. Let me just say there is eating everywhere at all times. It's fascinating. Okay, so that's how to accomplish that. It's, you've set a goal, specific and measurable. How about the person who wants to eat more fruits and vegetables? I hear this all the time. I'm like, well, how, how do you know you're going to accomplish that? Currently, this person eats less than two a day. Just for the sake of our time together, hold up your fist. This is a serving. Just use this. Don't make it complicated. If you're a guy, you get more. If you're a woman, you get less. Sorry. But if it's broccoli, eat two. You can't eat too much broccoli, right? But use that fist as a, just as an identifier. That, make that a serving of a fruit or a veg, all right? So if you eat less than two fists per day, but you want to eat two fruits and three servings of vegetables a day, what are the roadblocks to you doing that? You hate to grocery shop, you don't, and that's why you don't do it. You hate cleaning and chopping and making vegetables ready to eat, and you think vegetables are boring. That's common. So what can you do that is specific and measurable to get around that? Can you make a plan to go to the grocery store when it's less stressful? Don't go at Sunday right after church gets out, because that's when everybody goes, and they're getting ready. That, so plan when it works for you. Could you have your groceries delivered so you don't even have to go to the grocery store? Can you make a list of your favorite fruits and veggies? People will say to me all the time, I hate vegetables. I don't like them, I don't eat them. I'll say, all right, so how do you feel about salad? I love salad. I'm like, okay, what's in a salad? Lettuce, what do you like in your salad? Oh, I like mushrooms. Okay, there are two vegetables that you like when you thought you didn't like any, but we forget. So sometimes it's just the format that you consume them that makes you confused. So write down on a list, I like lettuce, I like mushrooms, and buy them every week, and then eat them. Can you buy them pre-prepped? You can buy anything already done for you now in the food world. You don't even have to turn on your oven. I talked to a, a gentleman here who's an um, executive chef at Zabar's, which is a big deli down on Broadway. And he said, people don't cook in New York. They order everything out. And he said, I've been in beautiful, very expensive kitchens. I'm the only one who's ever used them when I'm cooking for them. And I get that. He's from Wisconsin. We are, we're Midwest people. I understand that. So anyway, but you can buy anything pre-prepped, right? It's more expensive, but then it goes in you rather than not. So it's worth the cost, right? Can you go to a salad bar and just grab what you like for the week chopped up and then it's done? Can you experiment with some new recipes, not at five o'clock, when you come home from your day and you're starving, but in advance. And then finally, this person wants to eat out less often, which means they want to eat in more often. So how often do you currently eat out? More than seven times a week. That's not a stretch. If you grab coffee and a pastry or something four mornings a week on your way to work, and then you go out to lunch at work, and then you eat dinner out a couple nights during the week, and then I know people who say, I never cook on the weekend. I'm like, it's not such a happy thing for me to hear, but that's okay. We can work with it, right? But you can well go over seven times a week. But you want to change it to eat one weeknight out dinner, and you want one weekend dinner and breakfast. What are the roadblocks? You're too hungry or tired when you get home. I get that. Um, you don't know what to make because everybody that you live with wants something different. And you're lazy. People tell me that all the time. They're like, I'm lazy. I don't want to cook. Okay. Can you plan? 
in advance, which no one likes to do that. It's like a four letter word, the plan. But it's, unless you have what Steve mentioned, the chef and the, to do it for you, it's not gonna just appear in your refrigerator. You've gotta make a plan to make it happen. Could you find 10 lunch and dinner entrees that you can rotate through every 10 days? You know everyone loves in your, under your roof. You have the ingredients for and you can make it happen quickly. Can you batch cook in advance? Huge fan of that. Do, take an hour or two or have a day on a weekend and make food so that you have it for the week pack your lunch the night before. So being specific and measurable can help you accomplish that. So did that help you figure out how to find, if you've listed your health goals and maybe brainstorming some specific measurable ways to meet them to know that you're actually doing that. All right, the second step is I'd like you to identify what you value in terms of your health. So all of these things sound good, right? More energy, more flexibility, physically, not up here. You can work, that, that doesn't come from nutrition, but that comes from therapy. But if you work on you know, improved sleep, less pain, stamina, all of those things are valuable. On your paper, write down even one thing that you value that, that really means a lot to you, that's sort of non-negotiable. For me, it's kind of like the energy thing. I have a lot of energy and I value that and I, I really work to protect that. So think about something you value. And when you've identified those values and you've written it down, um, that's the secret to making some changes because the list of values that you write down really helps you identify the areas where you want to see change happen. And it helps you get clear about those decisions that you need to make on a day-to-day -day basis in order to see that, that value or protect that value. So your health values guide your activities on a daily basis. So I want you to think about the actions that you take that support those values. So let's say you value exercise, like that's a really important thing to you. So it improves energy, your flexibility, your stamina, your strength, that all comes from exercise, so they support each other. What about if you want to see improved lab values from your doctor? Nutrition and exercise both address that. And what if you value improving your sleep? Nutrition, exercise, and some stress management all work together to help with improved sleep. So exercise, nutrition, you can see that's the theme. Think over the last 24 hours. I know you're in New York. Some of you are traveling here. Some of you may live here. So I know you're outside of your normal routine. I know I certainly am. However, Think about what you've done in the last 24 hours, actions. Do they support those values that you wrote down? So if you value exercise, have you exercised in the last 24 hours? I know y'all have been in here since yesterday. I, I get that, I'm not, I'm really very aware of that. But think about, have you done something? Did you maybe take the stairs up here? You're on the third floor here. Did you take stairs from the first floor to come up? That's more activity than if you took the elevator. Did you get, if you took the subway, did you get off a few blocks earlier to walk here? That's activity. So think about, have you done activities that support what you value? You either do or you don't. Make sense? So when you align your act, that helps you in the days that you go, I don't really feel like exercising today. It is dark, it is rainy, it's cold, I don't wanna get up. If you think about you value that exercise and, and what you get from that so importantly, it guides your action, right? Okay, and then finally, let's talk about the principles of that acronym that I mentioned, EQFV. So E is environment, Q is quality, F is frequency, and V is volume. I think you'll find this pretty interesting because this is the part of my work that I just, well, I love all of it, but this is really, really fascinating. All right, so what impacts the choices you make in terms of food and nutrition on a daily basis? More solidly than your environment, right? So I love the work of Dr. Brian Wansink. He's out of Cornell. He wrote a book called Mindless Eating, Why We Eat More Than We Think. Some of you may have read it, or may be familiar with it. And he does a lot of interesting research. He did some research on environment and the food decisions that we make on a daily basis. So you have, what, you have when decisions, like when am I gonna eat? What decisions, what am I gonna eat? How much am I gonna eat? Where am I gonna eat? Who am I gonna eat with? You're, there are a lot of decisions wrapped around just feeding yourself, right? So he asked this group of participants in his study how many food decisions they think they make on a daily basis with food, beverage, um, and a typical snack. And they said, I make about 14 decisions on a daily basis. They manipulated the data, did some calculations, and came up with 227 
decisions that people make around food on a daily basis. So you can imagine how on a typical day, if you're making that many decisions, there's a lot of room for the influence of your environment and mindless eating, which means you're not paying attention. That go back to the person sitting in front of the TV and that bag of potato chips. And when are they full? When is that person who's eating out of that big bag of potato chips full? When the bag is empty or when the show ends, whichever happens first. And if they happen simultaneously, you're like, woo, -hoo! good. <laughs> yes, that's how you figure out when you're full. All right, so that's an environment and that's mindless eating. That's a perfect example of that. So when we, whoops, that's all I have on that one, that's right. So think about during like the rest of your day today, how present you are when you're putting something in your mouth. Are you paying attention or not? So environment really, really, really plays a big difference, or plays a big role. So let's talk about quality. Food gives our body information, and it gives us the materials that it needs to act on the information. So think about neurotransmitters in your brain. They're made up of building blocks of proteins and fat and carbohydrate and all those sorts of things. If you don't have all the building blocks, to build a really critical neurotransmitter, it can impact behavior in children, it can impact our mood, our cognition, right? So if you're feeding your body junky information and junky materials, you know what the outcome is going to be. It's pretty easy to figure that out. Better quality in, better um, output and function. So if we don't get the right information, our metabolic processes suffer, our health can suffer. So if you look at food in this way, it gives a view of nutrition beyond just how many calories and how much fat is in something, right? If you look at something that is a quality food, just something to fill up your belly and take the hunger away, anything with calories will take hunger away, anything, anything. Your calories are just fuel. But if you use quality fuel and quality calories, you get a better output in the long run. Um, so it really shifts the focus to foods to include versus always focusing on what shouldn't I be eating. So this is the part where you get to eat the chocolate. So if you reach into your bag and grab the Hershey's Kiss. All right, so just take your Hershey's Kiss, unwrap it, close your eyes, put it in your mouth, and let it sit there. Don't chew it. Really? And if you, if you, have, if you have an allergic reaction or you're not up for chocolate at 11.05, and don't, you don't have to do this. Nobody's going to arrest you if you don't do it. But if you'd like to participate, that would be great. So put it in your mouth, close your eyes, and just let it melt. And I want you to think as your eyes are, eat the chocolate with your eyes closed, just think about what you're experiencing with that Hershey's Kiss. Do you ever put a Hershey's Kiss in your mouth and just suck on it? You do? You do? You get an award, because I've never heard anyone say yes. It's the only way to do it. Yeah. There you go. All right, so, so when, it's, when it's finished, just take a second and just <laughs> jot down on your paper or just remember what you're experiencing. Like what comes to mind, like this is really good, or ooh, I hate Hershey's, or whatever you're saying. I mean, it doesn't matter. There's no right or wrong answer. And once you finish with that, then unwrap the red one, which is a Dove dark chocolate, and do the same thing with that. OK? If you want to take a sip of water in between, cleanse your palate. I don't have a little palate cleanser. Try that. So just take a minute, do the red, close your eyes, Put the Dove chocolate in your mouth and do the same thing with that. And if you already ate your chocolate and you need some, we'll bring it to you. Anybody need chocolate? Okay. All right, so put the red, so put the Dove in your mouth. Let that, just let that happen. Just let it sit there. And just make note of what you experience. Okay, so in the interest of time, who would like to share what they experienced with the Hershey's versus the Dove? Anybody want to share? Was there any noticeable difference for any of you? Any, any thoughts, yeah. any comments? There's nothing right or wrong. Just what did you experience? Um, when I did the, the Hershey's Kiss, because I no longer eat milk chocolate, and I really finished it. I remember I used to love Hershey's Kisses. My first opinion was yuck because <laughs> I don't like milk chocolate anymore. But when I did the Dove, mm, I'm still sucking on it. I know. I it's love, bigger. <laughs> I, but I love dark chocolate. And okay. Actually, and actually, though, it's a little sweeter than I'm used to. Yeah. So the sweetness actually came out to me. But that's just 
that's how I've learned to like less sweet chocolate. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else? Anybody else? I think Susan right yes. there. Just the, uh, the kiss just melted a lot faster. I assume it's just a cheaper, thinner chocolate or whatever it might be, but uh, yeah, it just melted a lot faster. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, I'll let Hillary talk. I felt like the same thing, like the kiss was gone really quickly, and the dark chocolate, I feel like I enjoyed it a little bit more because it took longer to melt. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so the dove, so there's no trick behind that. It really, the, the idea behind this exercise is the dove is a little bit bigger. I think if we weigh them, it's, it has a little more heft to it. But Hershey is a less expensive chocolate. It is milk chocolate. The dove, that's the dark chocolate, and it's a higher quality. It's not, you know, like Godiva or whatever, the, but it, it is a higher quality chocolate. And so the idea behind that was if you look at the quality, how many of those Hershey's kisses, if you had the experiences you two did, that it melted quickly, it wasn't as satisfying? Would satisfying be a word? Maybe the dark felt more satisfying, like, ooh, I just needed one of those, maybe two. Um, but I don't need half a bag of, like I would of the Hershey. Maybe you felt like you needed more Hershey's to get satisfied. Satisfaction and satiety is a really interesting area of nutrition and food to, to talk about and, and feeding yourself. But if you think about quality of food, if you can take that experience with you, it, where you distinguish between, again, like I said, anything will fill you up. If you had a little hunger pain and you ate enough of the Hershey's or enough of the Dove, either way, it would take the hunger away because you, they have calories. But which would leave you feeling like, okay, I'm finished, I'm satisfied, I can get on to the next thing, or ooh, that was really good, versus that was just not quite doing it. I need a little more something and then you're in the refrigerator scurrying around looking for something else and you eat that and then you keep going right so if you can focus on quality it can really make a difference in um, listening to those hunger cues for fullness so just to finish up about the quality idea so when it comes to weight management the actual type of calories fat protein carb in a laboratory where people are being fed it really doesn't make much of a difference the way those play out in terms of weight management but when people are out in just free feeding as we call it in research um, it looks like a little bit higher protein a little bit lower carbohydrate might make a difference if you're an athlete and you're eating in the sports nutrition world that's a whole nother discussion right but there then that becomes a little bit more important and impactful as well so I always think about what are you trying to accomplish with the food that you're feeding yourself are you looking at disease management or prevention are you looking at fueling athleticism what are you trying to do when it comes to specific foods obviously we know potato chips are not as high quality as brown rice but I want to use that to point something out to you you can buy organic potato chips you know that right what's so great about that in terms of nutrition. Anybody know? Nothing. It's the same. Potato chips are still, for an ounce, there are 120 calories and 10 grams of fat per ounce of potato chips. And it, just because the potatoes are organic, it doesn't change the calories. So, sorry, I know, I'm like the, I am the voice of reality. I am not going to tell you, organic potato chips will make you so skinny, because they won't. They're the same thing. The same thing as an organic chocolate chip cookie, whatever it is. Um, but Think about that because you get sort of brainwashed, if you remember, some of you, not all of you, back in the 90s with the low fat, no fat food lines of snack wells. People were like, I can eat the whole box because there's no fat. It's kind of where we're at now with organic and natural and raw and, right? I don't care how many raw dates you eat. They still have calories. They're very nutritious and good for your body in terms of fuel versus I have a bag of Hershey's Kisses, you get better output, but you still get calories. Okay, does that make sense? So that can help you kind of make choices as well. And then when it comes to specific diets, are there types of diets that are more quality diets than other? There's a Mediterranean diet, there is a plant-based diet, there is a chocolate chip cookie diet, I am sure. There are Twinkie diets, there's the Subway diet. Remember, whatever it is, if you are reducing calories and fat, you will reduce weight. Um, but they're not always the same type of quality. And then let's talk about frequency, and we'll finish up with volume very quickly. So frequency is how often you eat in a day, right? 
as I mentioned, as I've been noticing, I know everybody in the city's on a different time zone, but if you eat nonstop throughout the day without paying attention to whether you're hungry or not, you may struggle with your weight more, off, more readily than someone who doesn't, who only eats when they're hungry. And I don't mean only, it's very challenging to do that if that's not your nature. But you've heard, I'm sure, a lot about eat six small meals a day. That's what everyone needs to eat. That's too broad a recommendation. We've seen in the research that does not confer any health benefits. Will it keep your blood sugar stable? Yeah, if you have problems with blood sugar and you're struggling with diabetes, it might. But like in my house, I'm a three meal a day girl. I eat, I eat a lot, I'm done, I move on to the next thing because I, I just don't get hungry until it's time to eat. My husband is like a bird. He eats all day long. So, but that works for him, right? So you've got to figure out where you're at in that. And then using your body's hunger cues. There's something I use frequently with clients. It's called the hunger, or excuse me, the apple test. If you are really hungry, which you all might be because it's almost lunch kind of. So on a scale of one to 10, if, 10, if zero is empty, starving, 10 is Thanksgiving stuffed, where are you in that continuum right now? What number would you give it? If you are like above five, if you are an eight or a nine, so you're not really hungry. And I said, would you like an apple right now? What would you say? No, oh, thank you. If I said, would you like a Snickers bar? You'd say, sure, bring it on. That is not hunger. That's not tummy hunger. Sorry, that is not physiological, oh my God, I need lunch hunger. That is, I am having a crappy day and I'm really bored with this nutrition program. I want a Snickers bar <laughs> hunger, <laughs> right? Think about the different types of hunger, but your physically, physiological cues for hunger will never steer you wrong and that can help guide how frequently you need to be fueling yourself in the day. Because remember, overweight is, there's a link to cancer. Okay, there is a, there, we have a definite link there. And then finally, volume is simply how much you're eating. And I was laughing about this Friday night when I was at my favorite New York Italian restaurant and I just, I'm like, I'm finishing every bite of this pasta and I'm so full, I feel like I'm going to explode. But I didn't care. Because at that point, if you think about how you can manage the volume and how often you overeat or overconsume, and you can balance it. Because the next day, yesterday, I could have gone all day and not had a bite to eat. Because if you're listening, your body will guide you, right? So sometimes it makes sense to go in that direction. But if you're constantly overeating in volume, that can lead to weight gain. And that can lead to maybe not the highest quality calories, which again, all connect in your environment to not set up the most um, health supportive way of, of fueling. Does that make sense? So if you're letting the package size or the serving size or the plate size guide when you're finished or how much you eat, that's where you need to start paying a little attention. And I'll leave you with one final study from Dr. Wansink because I love this so much. A group of college students around a table, each of them had a bowl. And each of the bowls had tomato soup. Some of the bowls were just a bowl of soup. And they said, okay, go, start eating your soup. Everyone started eating. The ones who had just a bowl of soup stopped when it was empty. The other people had a bowl connected with tubing threaded through the bottom where they continued to pump soup into the bowl. So it was a continuous bowl of soup. It was some, some people's idea of nirvana, a never ending bowl <laughs> of soup, right? They kept eating, they kept eating, they kept eating because the bowl was not empty. So at the end of the study, when they asked the people with the bottomless bowl how much they overate, they estimated that they only ate about five extra calories when actually they ate 74% more calories than everyone else with just the standard bowl. So keep that in mind if you feel like I did Friday night, never ending bowl of pasta. I'm like, really, there's gotta be a bottom here soon. <laughs> Cause you know, when you're in a hotel and you can't take it back, yeah, anyway. But think about, think about that when you're eating, 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 and that's your stop gap is when you see land at the bottom of your bowl, right? You're not listening to the cues. So try to check in a little bit with that next time you eat and you'll be surprised at how it works. So now after all this, you're probably all just saying, so, okay, that's all fascinating, but just tell me what to eat, right? Just tell me, tell me. Sorry, I'm not gonna do that, but I will give you some gen general guidelines of putting more plants on your plate is one of the strongest recommendations through all the research in terms of health supportive choices for food, okay? So here's what it looks like to take one day, 
yes, I understand there's no meat here. We can certainly, oops, wait, we can go back to, we could add, you could add an egg at breakfast, you could add some turkey at lunch, you could add some salmon at dinner, and that would give you some animal flesh protein if you need that, but I wanted to show you the other side of that. This is a day where there is no animal protein, yet plenty of protein and quality nutrition and volume. When you're eating plants, there's a lot of fiber, and they take up a lot of space. I never have anyone say to me, I can't stop eating carrots, right? Because they're very filling, and you, you fill up before you can just eat an entire bag of them. So think about what this looks like and if this would be helpful in planning maybe every other day or twice a week you want to eat a day where you really cut back and, on animal products and increase the plants. And then this is the, um, the World Cancer Research Foundation, the American Institute for Cancer Research. These are their cancer prevention recommendations. I understand prevention doesn't apply to all of us. However, if you look at the very last bullet point, for cancer survivors, the recommendations are the same as for cancer prevention. So you can find this on the WCRF website, um, and I don't want to take the time to run through all of them, but again, it's being physically active, keep yourself lean as possible, um, limit the foods that drive weight gain like sugary, empty calorie foods, eat more plants, eat less animals, and limit alcohol. And then my call to action for all of you, um, this kind of comes out of my breast cancer experience where I greatly respect the walks and the runs and the, all of that sort of thing, but I just feel like the other 364 days of the year when someone's not walking or running, how are they doing something actionable to make a difference in their health? So I'd like you to locate an accountability partner, either in the room or somewhere later today. Exchange your email addresses, check in with them weekly for 30 days on what you're trying to do in terms of changing and elevating your health, and then email me your experiences to let me know how things are going, because only through action can we start to impact this tsunami of, of cancer. I mean, something's broken, right? In our, something's broken. And so by taking action with only what we can be in charge of, will it make a difference? And so I'd like to just close with um, a saying that I have a very dear friend who lives in Greece, and she's a dietitian, and she was with me from the start of the beginning of this journey uh, experience of mine. And when I shared my uh, diagnosis with her, even though it was horrifying, it was, again, the best kind. I had vanilla breast cancer, which is the one you want, apparently. Um, but she said, you are lucky in your unluckiness. That's what we say in Greece. And I just have held on to that because I truly am. And this is how you say it in Greece. I had her spell it out for me in Greek. But I thank you so much. I, th I think I probably went over a little bit of time, but I really appreciate your attention and playing along with my um, exercises. And that's all I have for you. Thank you.